Um, hello, my name is Matthew, and I just read The Naval Treaty by Sir Arthur Conan Doyle. This is a part of my read-along series and book club with Steve Donahue. We are reading Murder Mysteries in the month of March, and we're reading all of the Sherlock Holmes short stories. And The Naval Treaty is one of the longer short stories that I've read so far, and hugely enjoyable. It feels like a return to form of a um, straightforward detective fiction where there's um, a complicated, unsolvable case that Sherlock takes on. Very quickly we get into the case and spend a long time with uh, the narrative and the details, uh, Sherlock's investigation, and all of the intrigue and detective work and mystery um, that follows. But the very beginning of the short story starts with Watson um, talking to the reader, Watson deciding which story to tell us. He mentions that there have been a few cases that have been hugely important that Sherlock had been involved with, and he's deciding which one uh, to present to us. And I really feel like it's one of the main uh, reasons that these Sherlock Holmes short stories feel so inexhaustible, because we're constantly reminded that of the ones that we have, they were cherry-picked and selected by Watson, and were, there's constant references, allusions, to all of the Sherlock stories that we don't have. And it's, it's ever-present. It's something that is uh, uh, continual throughout the short stories. But after you get to a certain point, it does feel like th they're just limitless. And um, Watson is scratching his head and trying to figure out uh, which ones he wants to tell, either um, some are too sensitive or they're still um, in the public sphere or they haven't been solved yet or they, they've been too easy and they're not as interesting. Um, it's not up to the uh, Sherlockian snuff that Watson believes these short stories, these cases should be. And he, he uh, settles on uh, a case that is uh, personal to Watson it involves uh, an old uh, school classmate who um, years go by and writes him a letter and just says, I'm, I'm in trouble, I need your help, I, I know that you have uh, <clears throat> associations with this uh, Sherlock Holmes, please see if he would be at all interested in my case. Watson brings it to Sherlock's attention. All of this happens very quickly and we get to the meat of the story um, just within a few pages. And then for this very long short story, we, we spend time uncovering. And uh, it's, it's, it's successful. It, it's a fairly straightforward mystery um, on a grander scale. And... Um, there's discussion about other Sherlock cases where um, he's worked with heads of state and he's solved mysteries for entire countries and kings. And it's an example of um, a, a state secret, something that uh, could impact all of Europe, uh, the, the governments and militaries and Sherlock is being asked, and this is one of the rather minor ones, but there's a personal con connection with uh, Watson that makes it a little bit more interesting, and with all of the uh, uh, political and military and uh, governmental aspects, it's still, uh, from the reader's perspective, uh, a straightforward, uh, simple puzzle. So there's a there's Watson's school fellow who uh, is working for the government as um, 
an official, but uh, in, in, in the capacity of the story as a transcriber. And he's in a government building and an official comes and says, we have this highly sensitive document of a naval treaty and we need you to transcribe it. It's very important. It's the utmost importance. And um, he's in this huge cavernous hall and uh, nobody knows about the treaty. No one could possibly overhear that um, the official has the treaty, that um, the school, Watson school fellow is going to be transcribing the treaty. It's all um, completely a secret. And it's, the school fellow starts transcribing this thing and gets drowsy. He's getting sleepy. And he calls uh, to have coffee brought up uh, to awaken his senses. He even um, gets up and starts walking up and down to the uh, long hall to get the blood flowing. And it's not working. He's like, he's like falling asleep on the job, decides to go downstairs and uh, get the coffee himself. He had asked uh, his servant to get him coffee, and to his surprise, the servant's wife came up and said that she would be getting it for him, and then she just doesn't show up. So he leaves the room, leaves the sensitive document on the table, uh, and goes down and finds the servant that should have uh, come up to him in the first place also sleeping. So <laughs> the servant downstairs is sleeping. We have this uh, official transcriber uh, falling asleep when <laughs> they're both supposed to be uh, on the job. While they're down there, the bell rings. So in this cavernous hall, there's one of those bell ropes that would alert a servant to know uh, some assistance is uh, required. And uh, the cavernous hall is supposed to be empty. He's down there getting the coffee with the, the sleeping servant, and the bell rings, which just rings a shock of horror down his spine because no one should be in there. The Watson school fellow runs back to the hall, the conference room, and the official document is missing. And that's, that's the mystery. Uh, he, he lost this uh, very important sensitive document. It's going to possibly impact European military affairs, it's going to ruin his career, ruin his life. Uh, there's no clues, uh, barely any exits in, in, uh, in or out of the, the, the building. The corridors are uh, c contained. They, they mention um, a, a rat couldn't go by without it being noticed. And... Um, and <laughs> Uh, all of this comes out, and we find that Watson's schoolfellow is so stricken by this that he becomes bedridden for nine weeks. And I just love the behaviors of the Victorian aged <laughs> uh, people that suffer traumas where uh, they just get wiped out. But he's bedridden for nine weeks over, over this trauma. He's going to... Um, lose his job, it's going to ruin his life, and so he has to be sick for nine weeks. Um, when he finally stirs awake and feels better, he reaches out to Watson, and that's how Sherlock finds out about the case. And um, the fact that nine weeks went by uh, turns out to be uh, an integral clue, because this is supposed to be um, a document that could change nations. You, you would see if, if Russia got this information, this sensitive information, if France got this information, um, but nothing had happened. And, of course, all, all the, as the story is being told, it just seems like a complete mystery. Sherlock and Watson, they, they, they go to this house, um, interview different people. Overnight, there's a break-in. Uh, our... 
storyteller, this uh, school fellow of Watson, is now feeling well enough that he doesn't have to have round-the-clock care. He's sleeping by himself, and he's burglarized, he's burgled, catches the burglar at the window with a knife who scurries away, and um, we start getting hints of uh, Sherlock's um, eccentric behavior. There's uh, this rather tranquil moment in the heat of all of this um, uh, tension, dramatic air in the room. Um, people are talking and they're st stressed out and uh, high strung. <clears throat> Sherlock goes, there's a rose, there's a moss rose right outside this window. He flings the w window open, the sash open, and just admires uh, the beauty of a simple rose and talks about nature and how nature works and how a rose is just a little treat. It's an additional benefit and it's a, a way of uh, realizing that nature is inherently good because the rose is unnecessary. It doesn't have to be pleasant smelling. It doesn't have to be beautiful. And yet it is. And <laughs> the whole rest of the room is just horrified, kind of dumbstruck. This is the guy that's going to be solving the case. People hear about Sherlock and they know, but he's always in the sh he, he's more often than not in the shadows he's not taking as much credit for all of the fantastical things that he has done we learn that more and more he's giving credit to uh, scotland yard or the london police or uh, lestrade or whoever and so not everyone is immediately as impressed with sherlock as uh, watson or the reader and it's just a great moment of levity, I guess. And we get great examples of um, Sherlock's train of thought, his logic, the immediate steps that he takes, things that he tries. Um, some things seem to fail but they're actually clues when they fail. They're actually clues to something else and all of that. And we get a, a resolution, a, a really satisfying um, resolution. There, there, there's surprises where uh, Sherlock wants the school fellow to leave the house and go back to London uh, with Watson. There's an assumption that they're all going to be going back together. At the last moment, Sherlock says, well, I'm gonna stay in the house uh, you have that moment of uh, how on earth are we going to solve it? Why are, why are we going back to London? Why are you staying here? Um, and <laughs> I'll give a little bit. I'll give a little bit of um, the dramatic conclusion because it's so it's so perfect. So the the heart of the case is that there's documents that went missing. We figure out. Um, what happened, who took them, and th there's enjoyment in the uh, detective work, uh, the, the solving of the case. But th this is a story where it is solved, and it's solved in a dramatic fashion. So Watson and the school fellow went back to Baker Street. Uh, Sherlock promises that he'll be back um, in the morning for breakfast time. And it's a restless night. Watson and the school fellow are just rolling in bed. Uh, Watson even mentions um, the restlessness of the school fellow is rubbed off on them. They both both wake up in the morning, uh, bleary eyed and um, just as exhausted as they were when, when they went to bed. A horrible night. Sherlock's not there. Uh, the school fellow is in a, in a panic and even higher strung. Uh, Watson reassures him um, 
if, if Sherlock said that he'll, he'll be here at breakfast, breakfast time, uh, he will be here uh, no sooner and no later. Sure enough, um, at the appointed time of breakfast, Sherlock comes in and announces breakfast. And so there's going to be a Scottish breakfast, there's going to be uh, sausages and uh, curry and um, uh, eggs and bacon. He's saying what he's going to have for breakfast, what Watson is going to have for breakfast. It's all being served. Uh, Watson is confused. And the school fellow, who's just obsessed, uh, only has one thing at the forefront of his attention, is, is baffled that uh, Sherlock is sitting here so impressed with uh, and paying so much attention with uh, breakfast. And Sherlock is saying, well, what are you going to have for breakfast? And we're told that they have those silver domes uh, that really fancy restaurants would have, or uh, the silver domes that you would see rolled in on carts for room service. And um, Sherlock says, well, why don't you have this for breakfast? And the school fellow lifts up the lid, and to his astonishment, uh, the, the documents are on the breakfast plate. And it's even pointed out that Sherlock just couldn't resist this uh, dramatic flair. He figured out the case, and that wasn't good enough. He had to be have it revealed under a, a, a silver dish. And the story was good enough. Uh, the, the story was good enough to have the reveal be under a silver dish. Fantastic. So, just a, a really good straightforward detective story, mystery, uh, solved by the great Sherlock Holmes. This is The Naval Treaty by Sir Arthur Conan Doyle. Uh, if you've read it, please let me know. And um, thank you for watching. Please leave a comment if you would like, and take care.